If you are an edible gardener, I'm going to guess that you have a surplus of something you've grown. Whether it's too many tomatoes to eat in one sitting, zucchini, carrots, or a bumper crop of cucumbers. And it's horrible to think that we would let any of the precious food we worked so hard on all summer go to waste, right? That's where preserving our garden harvest comes in. It's a brilliant and old school way to build a reserve of nutritious and fresh homegrown food for you to eat year round. However, there are logistics involved, some materials needed in order to successfully can something to make it shelf stable and not hurt you when you eat it. (laughs) Plus, pickles. Who doesn't love pickles? No one loves pickles more than today's wonderful guest who got into the art of canning and has become a professional canning educator because of her love for pickles and a good Bloody Mary. And today she is going to walk us through an amazing episode all about how to can and ferment our garden harvests. At the end of this episode, you will be able to make your own savory pickle snack tailored to your exact tangy preferences with a myriad of things from your gardens. Get ready for this uncanny episode. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, the Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. podcast. Welcome. If you're new here, welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast. I'm your host, Maria Faella, and it's my calling in life to help you care for plants successfully and cultivate joy through doing so. And if you're a repeat listener, welcome back. Welcome home, plant friend. I'm so happy that you've come back to listen to this podcast. I'm so honored to be part of your planty journey. And whether you are a new or an old plant friend, please take a minute and send this episode or one of your favorite episodes of the podcasts to someone you think would love it. I have a secret goal to be the top home and garden podcaster. Right now, I'm the top female home and garden podcaster, but I want to be the top podcaster. And the way the show grows is through plant friends telling plant friends about it. So if you wouldn't mind, take a minute and send an episode to a friend. But let's dive into this episode. I am so excited to welcome back Stephanie after a very short hiatus. You might remember Stephanie from our homesteading interview, homesteading for beginners interview. She's one half of the duo from that episode. Stephanie Thoreau is a certified master food preserver, best-selling author of multiple books, including small-scale homesteading, which we discussed previously. But today, she's joining us to go through everything we need to know about preserving our garden harvests. She is an expert food preserver and has kind of dedicated her life to teaching people how to can. The story behind how she got into canning is so heartwarming, and I'll just let her tell you (laughs) instead of me tell you before the interview. But I'm really thankful for Stephanie. She's become a dear plant friend. Um, I love her and, you know, her counterpart, Michelle, from our past episode. And I feel like that's half the fun of doing this podcast is I just get to meet really interesting plant people. If you are interested in meeting plant people and making plant friends, I would love to formally invite you to join my online garden society. I wanted to give a shout out to three new members, Jamie H., Steph F., and Ashley K. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Garden Society. If you don't know, my Garden Society is my online platform and app for both iOS and Android with the goal of making new plant friends, propagating your knowledge, and growing more joy in your life. It's what I like to call the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. It's an online space for our community of international listeners to connect, like I said, propagate their plant care knowledge, and just like nerd out about plants together. It's so fun being in there. And we've had so many new members join in the last couple of months. So you can go to jointhegardensociety.com to join us. And also just know that if you join your monthly membership, which is the price of a cup of coffee, supports the show and it helps me pay for the editors and podcast managers and the people that keep the show coming to your ears for free on a weekly basis. So thanks in advance. See you at jointhegardensociety.com. Okay, back to Stephanie. This episode was so inspiring. Billy, my husband, has briefly gotten into pickling, but this is definitely making me like 
dream about preserving our garden harvest on another level. I can't wait to try water bath canning. We grew way too many tomato plants for just two of us this year. So we're going to have a lot of tomatoes <laughs> to, to enjoy throughout the winter. So we're, we're definitely going to um, gonna do some water bath canning. I'm going to let Stephanie walk you through the entire process. We've linked to her books if you want the tutorial. You know, she has great photo tutorials. Can you guys hear Frankie? Frankie, you're being very loud today. Frankie's my baby parakeet. He's the love of my life, and he's really chatty. I think he wants to be in this podcast with you guys today. Anyway, all of Stephanie's links are in the show notes, but without further ado, let's get right to the conversation. Stephanie, welcome back to Growing Joy so soon. Thank you. I'm so excited to have you here. You were on a very successful episode we had, the Homesteading for Beginners episode. And when I realized that your bread and butter is actually canning and you have three books on food preservation and canning, I was like, wait, can you come back? (laughs) We need to do a full episode on food preservation. So right now, as everybody's gardens are in the peak of their harvest, I'm so excited to dive in. Can you give us a sense of, you know, we've already met you in your amazing homestead in that previous episode, but can you give us some insight into your journey into canning? Like, how did you get interested in food preservation and canning? Yeah, sure. Almost 20 years ago, I was just looking for a new hobby and I decided I wanted to learn how to can because I loved pickles and I loved Bloody Marys and I wanted to make my own pickle for my Bloody Mary. Mm, Love that. Yeah. So I knew one person at the time that canned and that was my now husband's aunt and she was in Eau Claire, which is in Wisconsin. And I asked her if she'd teach me and she was happy to. That's kind of the thing with canners are always happy to teach you. (laughs) So if you know any. Like plant people, right? Like gardeners. (laughs) It's like they're so ready to share their skills. Yep. So we planned a weekend and I headed over to Eau Claire and then we went to the farmer's market and we picked out pickle, pickling cucumbers and beets and fruit. And we spent the whole entire weekend canning and it was just so much fun. And I learned so much about her and we just, yeah, we just shared stories. And then I realized how easy it was and I was just completely hooked after that one weekend. And so then I I continued to can and I've never stopped. (laughs) Had you had a garden at this point or you were going to the farmer's market and you were just finding fresh food to preserve? At this point, I didn't even have a house yet. So I had not gardened at all. Oh, okay. And I wasn't into really farmer's markets either. I was young, early 20s. And so then when we bought our house 15 years ago, we did start gardening and then it's just grown on from there. But I still use the farmer's markets to get most of the stuff I do can because I could never grow enough of what I need. Totally. So with canning planning, ooh, that's a fun canning planning. That's the title of your next book. What do we need to know about like planning to preserve? Is there a window in which when we pull the fruit or vegetable off of the vine into the can, does it need to be fresh? Can we kind of do a big harvest, eat what we need and then can whatever, you know, we don't eat? How? What's the strategy behind the timing of canning? Sure. I always try and preserve within 48 hours of whenever it's been harvested because the fruit and vegetables, they start to lose their vitamins so quickly. So if you're going to take the time to process it and preserve it, you want to preserve those vitamins too. And so especially like to make a crispy cucumber or dill pickle, you're going to want to preserve it within 48 hours. Yeah. So with tomatoes, I freeze those. Those are easy to freeze because I am cooking those. So you don't need like a crispy tomato, right? You're not looking for that. Mm-hmm. So that's easy. We um, freeze gallons of tomatoes and then I'll process those in October or November when the gardens are finished up and when the temps are a bit cooler. And then I'll make all my like pizza sauces and yeah, all the tomato based things at that point. Okay. So you want to preserve it as soon as possible. But if you are picking your first tomato or your first cucumber of the season, you can freeze it until it's time to preserve it. I wouldn't freeze cucumbers. Okay. Just tomatoes, certain things, you know, it varies. So in general, you're going to want to preserve your stuff right away. With tomatoes though, even if you're freezing it, that's still preserving the nutrients in it and then you're canning it. But yeah, as far as like pickles or anything in general, you're going to want to preserve it as quickly as you can to keep the most nutrients, if that's important to you, (laughs) which it is to me. Okay. Yeah. So preserving, there's canning and there's fermenting. So what's the difference? 
Yeah, so water bath canning is what I write about. That's for your acidic foods like or foods that have been acidified. So I'm you acidify with vinegar, lemon juice, citric acid. And so that's like your any of your pickles, jams, jellies, chutneys, relishes, your fruit sauces, and then your tomato based products like Bloody Mary mix and and your pizza sauce and whatnot. And so those are all water bath canned goods. And so with that, you're exposing your food to super high heat in the water bath canner for a period of time. And that will kill off all the microorganisms like yeast and mold and bacteria that could cause your canned good to spoil. So by exposing it to that high heat, it also is pushing the air out of the jar. And then when you take it out of your canner to cool, your lid suctions on it, vacuum seals to your jar of food. And that keeps all the air and other contaminants that could get back in out. So it preserves it for, mm. you know, one to two years at this point once it's cooled down. And then you can keep it in your pantry. Shelf stable. Yep, shelf stable. But as time goes on, it will start to deplete too. So that's why they generally say to eat your canned goods in one year to 18 months. Like technically my jar will be sealed in two years probably or two and a half years, but it starts to break down. Things start to get softer. Colors change. It's just a little less appealing. So generally one year to 18 months for that. And then fermentation, um, the the type I teach is called lacto-fermentation or lactic acid fermentation. And it's also known as wild fermentation. And what that means is we're not adding any starter cultures in to kick off this process. We're just using what's naturally on the vegetable. And so what that means is that the lactobacillus, the bacteria that's naturally present, is converting the sugars into lactic acid. And then the lactic acid works as natural preservative in your ferment. And so it keeps the bad bacteria at bay while allowing the good bacteria to thrive. And that's when you hear about the probiotics and whatnot. And so that's what's happening. And and there's no heat involved. It's all done at room temperature. And with fermentation, it's not shelf stable, right? You need a refrigerator for them? All of might end up in the refrigerator because if you're leaving it on the counter at room temperature, it's going to continue to get softer. Now, Yes, everything will end up in the refrigerator, but it's also up to personal preference. Like I like my sauerkraut to ferment for about five weeks, five, six weeks. Some people like really soft sauerkraut and they might want it to go for like three months. It's up to you. Before they put it in the fridge. Yeah. So they let it ferment at room temperature and then you put it in the fridge to have it kind of slow down fermentation or something. Right. Stop. It doesn't stop. It just slows it way down. So once it goes in the fridge. Oh. Yep. So like if I have a sauerkraut and I put it in the fridge at week six and I love how it tastes, once maybe a month later, that's going to taste different. It's going to be different than what I put in the fridge a month prior. It's still going to be delicious, but expect changes as things are in the fridge. Got it. So this is why my husband with his sourdough starter puts his starter in the fridge when we go on vacation because it slows it down. Okay. I'm putting dots together. Another thing about fermentation I just wanted to draw attention to, and I think that's what I'm the most excited to start doing. I just started working with this holistic nutritionist who's helping me heal my hormones and my gut. She has me eating fermented foods once a day, if not multiple times a day, because that fermentation is so good for your gut flora. So I'm doing kefir and kombucha and all sour. I eat sauerkraut every day. And I didn't realize like the health benefits of fermentation for our guts, which I think is super interesting. Great that you're getting a variety of different foods too, because there's a variety of different bacteria in each of those things. And what's really cool is that you only need one like spoonful of sauerkraut a day to get all the bacteria, all the good probiotics that you need. People think you need to be like eating it at every meal, but there's enough in that one spoonful to take care of you. And I have people say, well, I have a supplement. I take a supplement. And that that's great. But you're getting like billions of copies of the same bacteria. Whereas if you're making these fermented foods yourself, you're getting a larger variety of healthy belly bacteria. Totally. And in addition to that, through the process of fermentation, it's breaking down the the vegetables that you're eating. So it's easier for your body to digest them. My husband has Crohn's disease and to eat raw cabbage can be pretty hard on his system, but he doesn't have a problem with fermented cabbage. That makes so much sense. Yeah, right. And it makes the vitamins and nutrients more readily available for your body to absorb too. Yeah. 
Amazing. I'm so curious, what does your storage look like? What is your pantry? Do you have like a root cellar or a shed you're storing all of this in? So we have a basement because we're in Minnesota. So it's nice and cool down there. I do keep my canned goods in this. Well, it's a covered well. Back when this home was built, there was a well. They covered it at some point. And it's a really creepy room now, <laughs> a little space. And But they had built in a place to put my canned goods. I assumed they were for the canned goods, but they were actually for like the canned, store-bought canned goods because mm-hmm. I asked the neighbor, oh, did so-and-so used to can? I was all excited. No, it was just <laughs> where she kept her stuff. It's a good, dark, cool space. So that's where I keep a lot of my home canned goods. And then I have a second refrigerator that I keep in the basement Mm. and we put a lot Mm -hmm. of our fermented foods down there. Smart. I love that. Okay. So why don't we start with canning? What are the materials that you need to can? Initially, you're going to need a canning pot. They sell in big box stores or you can find them at garage sales a lot. A big kind of like your ideal canning pot, but you don't need something Mm -hmm. that big. I have for the people actually watching, this is a fourth burner pot. You just need a pot that's big enough to submerge your jar in and you need to imagine at least one inch of water on top of your jar and then you need an inch or two on top of that. So when you're boiling your water bath, it's not splashing over onto your stove. So you probably have like a stock pot. So it needs to be tall. Yeah, you just need a tall sided one. You probably have something in your cupboard right now. We have like a lobster yeah. boiling pot. That's that. like a huge, tall, wide pot. So what you're saying for those listening and not watching is it's the height that Stephanie is talking about. It needs to be tall so there's space on the top for air. Yep. So you need that. And then you need a lid. Your pot needs a lid and it's going to need a rack. And so this fourth burner pot comes with a rack inside. So if I, we have a raspberry bush out front. And once we're sick of like eating them fresh and doing things with them, sometimes I'll just can one jar of raspberry jam Mm, and I'll do it in this little fourth burner pot. The reason you need the rack, though, is because a couple of reasons, actually. If you're putting your preserves, your jars right on the bottom of the pot, it's more likely to experience like thermal break. There's too much of a temperature discrepancy. And so the jar might crack. So that's number one. Number two, the hot water bath, the boiling water needs to be able to get on all sides of your jars to properly heat it to the middle of your jar. Like the food needs to be thoroughly heated to safely be preserved. And so those are the two reasons you need a rack of some sort. If you're buying like a kit, it will come with a rack. You can get creative and you can zip tie canning jars to get like the rings, the canning jar rings together to make Mm -hmm. a rack. I've even heard you can use towels. I don't really like to use, I have used the towel, but they get, they kind of float up and I feel like you're more likely to burn yourself with that. Mm -hmm. But as long as there's some sort of something in between your jar and the bottom of the pot, I've even used um, silicone trivets at the bottom. Mm. That works too. Okay. And then you'll need your canning jars and brand new lids. They say don't reuse your lids and then rings. And then canning tongs, brought my canning tongs. And this is to lift the jars out of the hot water bath so you're not burning yourself. Right. They're tongs that have like a silicon coating outside of them. Yeah. Right. There are a couple other tools that kits come with. I don't use them, but one would be like it removes the bubbles out of your preserves before you put the lid on and and preserve it or put it in the water bath canner because you don't want any air bubbles in there if you can help it. And then they also sell a... uh, a lid thing, a magnet on a stick, basically. So you can take your lids, your hot lids. But I just read that ball, their new lids, that ball brand, um, you don't have to warm the lids anymore, apparently. You used to have to warm them up so that the sealing compound got softened so that it would be more likely to, you know, seal to the jar. But I guess you don't have to do that with ball jars anymore. But I'll probably continue to do it anyway. (laughs) Just out of habit. Well, that's the perfect segue. So can you walk us through like a little canning basics tutorial now that we've got all of our materials? Tis the season for fall weddings, plan friends, and I cannot think of a more unique, a more delightful wedding, birthday, or anniversary gift than a Wind River wind chime. You can even get your December holiday orders in early and save yourself the holiday shopping stress. Wind River Chimes will deliver the most magical, most thoughtful, personalized gift straight to your door. 
forget the crowds at the mall. When you use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout with them, you can get a free engraving on any engravable wind chime, so you can personalize it with a wedding date, an anniversary date, or a special message. For over 35 years, Wind River Chimes has been passionately pursuing harmony by delivering wind chimes that help create a peaceful, soothing, restful environment. Mama Fiella recently visited my house and would not stop talking about the wind chimes' magical tones that wafted throughout our house all day. She requested one for Christmas. A Wind River Chime is the perfect gift because every time the recipient hears the gorgeous chime singing in the wind, they will think of you and be gifted a moment of calm. Plus, when you use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout, you can get a free engraving on any engravable chime. So head over to windriverchimes.com, listen to all of the different melodious options, pick from a variety of gorgeous colors, and use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout at windriverchimes.com for your free engraving to create the most special gift for your most special someone. Tis the season for fall planting and feeding plant friends. And if you're doing either of those things, you should be doing it with Ospoma Organics, a family owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. Whether you're planting for fall or really any season, whenever you're starting plants, whenever you're getting plants in the ground, you should be doing it with their Biotone Starter Plus. It's the ultimate starter plant food. It's this amazing, rich blend of the finest natural and organic ingredients, and it's enhanced with beneficial microbes, humates, and mycorrhizae, and those things help the plants establish faster, grow deeper roots, and bigger blooms. So it just gives your plants like a little helpful nudge. It just like sets them up for success when you're putting them in the ground and just helps them establish faster. It's fabulous. I've been using it for years. And there are never any sludges or fillers used in Espoma products. They're not messing around. Then, once your plants are in the ground and they're established, you can follow up and feed them with Espoma's line of amazing fertilizers called tones. But these are specific tones or specific fertilizers for whatever you're planting that are tailor-made specifically for that type of plant. So they have garden tone for your garden, holly tone for holly, flower tone for your flowers, plant tone, rose tone, berry tone, bulb tone, tree tone. Whatever you're growing, they have a specifically tailored tone or fertilizer for it. And the consistency with Espoma Organics is always on point because they have a state-of-the-art solar-powered manufacturing facility. To learn more about their indoor and outdoor products, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or you can click the link in the show notes to go to my Amazon storefront where I have a curated list of my Espoma favorites for you. So if I'm going to can in the morning, I will throw my jars in the dishwasher and get them going. And then at that time, I can, you know, prep my fruit or whatever. The next thing I will do is wash my canning lids. Lids come as two pieces. There's a lid and a ring. You don't have to wash the rings, but I wash my lids in warm and soapy water. If you don't have a dishwasher, you can wash your jars with warm and soapy water. You used to have to sterilize your jars, but if you're going to water bath can anything over 10 minutes, you can skip that step and they just need to be clean. Then I'll start my pot of water if I'm doing a big batch and I have my big pot because that takes a while. And then once my jars are almost done, I'll start cooking up my fruit. If I'm making jam and it's fruit and sugar and sometimes lemon juice, and you're going to mash it up and simmer it until it gets thickened. Now, I don't really use commercial pectin in in anything I, I use. And one recipe of all my books requires commercial pectin. I like the slow cook method. So I like to just simmer it down until it gets thick enough to be like a jam consistency because I just kind of don't want anything extra in my food if I don't need to. And so it'll take about 20 minutes or so. And I can tell I can eyeball it, but there's all these tests you can do if you read my book or look online to see if your jam is thickened enough. And then you take your clean jars and you're supposed to keep them warm until you're ready to use them. So I just leave them in my dishwasher because it keeps them warm. The reason you want to keep them warm is same thing, thermal break. So if I'm putting super hot jam into a cold jar, it's more likely to break. Mm, Okay. And so I keep them warm. I take it out, fill up my jars, and then I take a dampened paper towel and I clean the rim of my jars because you want to remove anything that has dripped on it. Because if there's food or something on that sealing rim, there's a chance that your jar might not seal. So you clean that off. I do that with a dampened paper towel. I do it again with a dry one just to make sure. And then I put my lids on and the rings. I twist the rings on 
and you don't want to tighten them on really tight, you're just doing it till it's like fingertip tight or just snug. You don't want it too loose either because while it's in the water bath canner, they kind of jiggle around and then you might or your ring might all off. So you just want it just snug, not super tight, not too loose. And so once you have all your jars in the canner and they're covered by at least one inch of water, you'll put the lid on and then crank up your heat to high. And then once the canner starts a rolling boil is when you start your timer per your recipe. So the full can, including the tops, is submerged underwater. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. One thing I forgot to say is when you're filling your jars, your recipe will indicate if you're to fill it with a quarter inch or a half inch of headspace. That's just the space from the top of the food to the rim of the jar here. You can see there's a little bit of headspace there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so follow that. That's just so to avoid siphoning. Siphoning is when food through the process of the water bath canner, food can start to be pushed out. So you want to leave the proper head space because if food's pushed out, again, there's a chance that your jars will not seal. So just follow that. Once you get a rolling boil, you set your timer, not before. And once 10 minutes is usually what it requires for jams and pickles and whatnot, has gone, turn the heat down, take the lid off and let it sit about five minutes. Just let things cool down a little bit. And then you remove your jars with your jar lifter. Put it on a towel-lined surface. And again, you want it lined with something to avoid the jars breaking from putting the super hot jars onto a cold surface. And then you do not touch them until the next day or at least 12 hours. You let them cool off completely. And then you'll start hearing them sealing. You'll hear the little ping, 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 ping. And that's just the lid being sucked down. And don't touch them. Still don't touch them. You can look at them. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and there'll be water on top and you'll be tempted to like tip the water off. Don't do that because you're potentially going to be pouring some food into that ceiling rim again. So just always keep your jars up and down flat and that water will dry up. And then um, the next day, once they're totally cooled, you can remove the rings like I have here and you can try and push the lid off. I can tell that I've got a good suction. I don't hear anything and there's absolutely no give here in the middle of the slit mm-hmm. this is a sealed yeah like the snapple can pop so it's that pop yeah. of the seal and it's the magic in the cooling the product going from boiling hot to cooling that's the magic that happens to make the seal right so that's why it's important to not touch it yes and if i skipped that water bath canner and i just poured say hot brine over cucumbers and it's make a pickle that lid will most likely seal. And people think, oh, I can skip that water bath canner process. My jar is sealed. Well, it's not all about it being sealed. Like I said, you need to expose it to that high heat to kill off any anything that could cause it to spoil. So if you want to skip the canner and you want to do your pickles or your jams that way or whatever, you need to store it in the refrigerator to be safe. What are the biggest mistakes you see people, super beginners making when they're canning? Well, like following an influencer that just randomly posts a recipe that isn't like a professional food preservationist. Mm -hmm. I see Mm -hmm. that all the time. That makes me nervous because they have a huge following and they trust them and they're, they're sharing something. So, I mean, I would think that I could trust them if I didn't know better. You don't want to just trust anybody. Make sure you're following knowledgeable sources or, you know, the National Center for Home Food Preservation has, is a great resource. That's where you know, I get a lot of my, where I confirm things I have learned. They have a version of their food preservation content that you can get in a book form, but it's all free online. So I would say if you have any questions, you know, reference that website. And like I said, people not actually canning it. They'll see online that you can just pour the hot thing and hot food in the jars and they'll seal and that's good enough. No, it's not. Or like an old thing that they used to do is that they would pour the hot food and put the ring on and put it upside down. It still seals because of the heat, but it's not actually safe. You know, they found out over the years. And so that's a big mistake. And touching their jars too soon. I hear that all the time. They'll write me and say, my jar didn't seal. And I'm like, well, when did you pull it out of the canner? And they're like, five minutes. I'm like, stop touching your jar. (laughs) (laughs) Stop touching your jar. This is a practice in patience. There's an emotional lesson with everything we do. So canning is a practice in patience. I love that. There's something else, actually, I should tell people. When their canned goods are 
sealed up and totally cooled, you're going to want to date them and label them and then store them in a, a dark, cool place. I used to forget to always date or label. I'd be like, I'm going to remember what this is. You won't just date and label them unless they're really obvious, like pickles. <laughs> Got it. Um, and don't stack. You want to store them with the rings off and you don't want to stack them because you don't want to create any false seals. So if okay. I have my canned goods just one level, not stack, no rings on, and something happens to the seal and it will just push off and I'll know when I get it out of my pantry that something's wrong with this and I, I won't mm-hmm. eat it. But if I had them stacked or if I have the ring tightly screwed on and something spoiled, this lid wouldn't be able to lift off. Okay, got it. That's a great tip. Okay, so no stacking and take those rings off. Awesome. Okay, and so the water bath canning is going to be for the acidic foods, like you said, tomato sauce, jams, anything that has vinegar in them. Fermenting is what's going to break down. So let's move to fermenting. What do we need to ferment something as a new sauerkraut enthusiast? I would love to make my own sauerkraut. That sounds super fun. Yeah, it's really easy. I brought for those watching, this is all you really need to get started is a canning jar, a quart canning jar. Can you describe it for those listening? Yeah, it's just a quart canning jar, quart size canning jar. Well, that's all you need. And you could use the canning lid and ring that you get. That's all you really need. But I like to use these silicone lids with nipples because the air, the gases that are created can release on their own, but it's not letting contaminants in your jar. So I like that. And it's also helpful if you have a jar weight to keep the food submerged under the brine when you're fermenting. And you can buy jar weights. I use the lids of Weck jars from their small jars because they fit inside of the wide mouth canning jars really easily. And sometimes I'll need two or three, but I've been using them for years. And that's really all you need to get started. If you are looking for your next planty coffee table book, my plant friend, you should check out The Cottage Garden by Danish gardening celebrity Klaus Dalby. The Cottage Garden explores the history and development of the beloved cottage garden design style. I gotta tell you, this book is overflowing with textures and colors with hundreds of full color photographs that will leave you swooning and inspired. In the pages of The Cottage Garden, you'll first draw inspiration from the stories and landscapes of generations of famous cottage gardeners, and then you'll meet modern cottage gardeners from around the globe who combine billowing masses of flowers such as poppies, delphinium, lupines, foxgloves, peonies, roses, lilies, and so many more to create the most dreamy landscapes infused with romance and wildness of the cottage garden style. The Cottage Garden is a gorgeous, glorious cottage garden inspiration book that you will love showing off on your coffee table. You'll gain so much inspiration from it. Go ahead and pick it up at your favorite local bookstore, bookshop.org, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon.com. That's The Cottage Garden by Klaus Dalby, wherever books are sold. The Cottage Garden by Klaus Dalby. My friends, I just returned from the most amazing vacation in Italy, and particularly what made it so amazing is the work that I did before I left to refresh my Italian with Rosetta Stone. I've been prepping for this trip to Italy for the last several months with daily doses of Rosetta Stone on their easy-to-use platform and app. It makes learning a language or refreshing a language so easy, and I had so much fun while doing it. It was a great way to wake my brain up in the morning. If you have international travel coming up, I gotta tell you, knowing the basics of the local language helps so much. Much. When we were in Italy, we were able to avoid the tourist traps and we were able to really plug into the culture, right? That's why you travel internationally. If you've had learning a language on your bucket list, Rosetta Stone has been the expert in language learning for 30 years. They've helped millions of people build the fluency and confidence to speak new languages through immersion. It even has this cool speech recognition feature, which actually tracks how you're pronouncing the language and gives you feedback on how to pronounce it with a more authentic accent. Whether you want to refresh a language skill you learned a while ago, like like I did, maybe you want to learn a new language to get the most out of your travel, Rosetta Stone can help get you there. They have 25 languages to choose from and a lifetime membership. So I learned Italian this year, but because I have the lifetime membership, I can learn Spanish or Chinese next year or in 10 years. And they're giving you 
an insane discount. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a limited time, Growing Joy listeners get 50% off Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Plan friend, it's a (laughs) no-brainer. Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com slash today. That's rosetta, R-O-S-E-T-T-A, stone.com slash today. So the food weight is a glass or something that's literally you're putting on top of the cucumbers that you're putting in your pickles to weigh the cucumbers down. Yeah, because okay. you need to keep everything submerged under the brine. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, cool. Tell me about the brine. What do we need for the brine? So when you're fermenting vegetables, you're going to use one of two methods. It's either the dry salting or the brining. So when you're doing sauerkraut, you use the dry salt method, which is we're cutting up cabbage and we're adding salt. That's it. We're massaging the salt into the cabbage to create a natural brine. So it's pulling out the Mm. natural liquids in the cabbage to create that brine. So that's dry salting. And then we'll keep the shreds of cabbage pushed under that brine for weeks, you know, depending on what your ingredients are. If there's carrots or onions or things that have more sugar, it won't take as long. And then brining is when you create a salt water brine to submerge food in. So that's what I would use for making pickles if I were going to make fermented pickles. And that's where you can kind of add the flavors and stuff too. Yeah, you can add the flavors in either method, but that's the difference. I'm creating a, a liquid brine with salt and water or I'm making it by pulling the juices out of the vegetables with just salt. And with the brine, are you heating it or can you just like mix it all up in a thing and do it room temperature? I don't heat anything when it comes to vegetable fermentation. Everything's at room temperature. Okay. So this also feels easier. This feels much easier than the water bath canning. (gasps) I think it's really easy, but people get more weirded out with the fermentation because they're like, I'm leaving this on my counter and it looks weird and cloudy and it weirds people out more, but it's actually safer. There's never been a confirmed case of food poisoning or anything with fermented vegetables. So I tell people that in my classes to put them at ease because think of how many recalls we have on fresh food from the grocery store. Yeah. Because they haven't handled it properly. But the fermentation is going to kind of go in and kill any of the things that might... Keeps it very safe. Yeah. Mm, interesting. If you're doing canning, any sort of food preservation, regardless of which method you're using, you want to clean your space first. Clean all your supplies, pull your hair back, put on a clean shirt. If you have jewelry on, I take it off. If you have nail polish, I don't. I barely ever wear nail polish because I'm always like in the food and I imagine it flakes off or something. So if you have fake nails or your nails are important to you, wear gloves. Keep everything clean. Number one, because cross-contamination and and food poisoning is completely avoidable. We don't need to be getting sick. So just keep that in mind. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. We're doing this to not get sick, right? Exactly. So fermenting basics, what do we need to know? Keeping it at room temperature. The Like in the summer, my kitchen is warmer. So ideally, I like to ferment around 68 to 72 degrees. So my favorite time of year is like late fall or in the winter to ferment because if it's warmer, it's going to ferment faster and that impacts the flavor. And as you do it, you'll kind of figure that out, what you like and what you don't like and how the cooler temps slow the process down. So sometimes my kitchen, we have really cruddy windows. Sometimes my kitchen's like 60 degrees and things take a little bit longer. So expect that if you don't have air conditioning or a basement You could ask a friend to watch over it. (laughs) I mean, I've watched a sauerkraut for my brother-in-law before. (laughs) And when you say watching, is there daily notes or daily things you have to be doing in order to ensure success? That's my next tip. So you want to make sure that things are always submerged, like I said. And with sauerkraut especially, as it's fermenting, little air bubbles or little gas bubbles will be created between the shreds of food and it pushes things up. And so I go in and I push things down. Now, other people will tell you, don't open it, don't touch it. This is just what has worked for me. And I find is like close to no fail is to look at your ferments every couple of days, make sure everything's submerged. If anything is exposed to air, it's going to likely mold. And if it molds, you got to get rid of it. 
So you're taking the cap off and submerging it again or shaking it? Yeah. Well, if I'm using a glass jar like this, I can see if it's submerged or not. I don't have to open it. Mm -hmm. If you're using a fermentation crock, you'll have to take the lid off and check it out. Oh, no. But I mean, so say you have the glass jar and you notice that your pickles are not submerged. Are you then taking the the top off to resubmerge them? Yep. I take it off and then I use my clean hands or clean fork or something and push it back down and then put the lid back on. Okay, got it. And uh, what's the timeline for these things? I'm assuming it's different for different recipes, but what's the general timeline? It will vary depending on what you're doing. Like you said, sauerkraut, I like to go five, six weeks if it's just cabbage. If I have hot peppers, sliced hot peppers, grated carrots, chopped up onions and garlic, it's going to go for like a week. It's going to be done a lot sooner, but it's really up to your personal preference. So I say after a week, give it a taste. If it tastes very raw still, ferment it for another five days and give it another taste. You're using your taste buds to know when you're ready. Yeah, because okay. it's so much personal preference. But one thing I haven't mentioned is you will have to leave headspace when you're fermenting as well. And that is because, like I said, things will bubble or push up. And that just gives you an opportunity to push back down or to not have it spill over. Because <laughs> if you're if you're filling your jars really high, it will bubble out. And then you have like, you know, brine all over your counter. So I leave about two inches of headspace when I'm making fermented vegetables too. Okay, got it. Any big troubleshooting with fermenting that you want to give people a heads up to avoid? Just watch the brine level. Because if it molds, it's gone and then that's a bummer. And that's really the main thing. They say in the fermentation world, under the brine, all is fine. (laughs) Keep that in mind. (laughs) (laughs) And again, using fresh veggies. I mean, if you're going to use older cabbage to make kraut, expect that it's going to take a little bit longer for that brine to be made, that natural brine that you're trying to create versus using something that's freshly harvested. And get creative. Add in what you like. Keep out what you don't like. And it's a lot easier than you think. Give it a try. (laughs) It seems like it. It's like throw some salt and some sauerkraut, say prayer and see how it all shakes (laughs) out. Not sauerkraut, into some cabbage. Can I make a jam and water bath it or cut up some cabbage and put salt in? Like, what's the importance of recipes? Do I really need to find vetted recipes or can I just freestyle it? Well, I think there's more wiggle room with fermentation for freestyling for sure. But with both methods, like follow the rules initially. And as you do it, you will learn where you can kind of tweak it to your liking. But definitely for beginners, follow those trusted recipes and don't stray away from that path at first. Where do we find the trusted recipes? Obviously, you have a glorious book that has so many photos and I will be, you know, learning alongside your book when I go try it with my mom. But um, where are good trusted online resources that people can find recipes compared to, you know, the influencers that maybe not to say you should call anyone out, but like where can people go and feel good about using that information? They have Tested Recipes. Ball has several books. I would start there. Or like I said, the National Center for Food, Home Food Preservation. That is a great resource. I mean... Okay, we'll link to it in the show notes too. I'll send you that. Yeah. What are your favorite recipes? Tell me your favorite fermentation recipes and your favorite canning recipes. Obviously, you're a pickle girl. So tell me about... Did you see the Sprit Society? Well, you don't drink, but the Sprit Society came out with a pickle. They did a collaboration with Clausen's pickles and they have a pickle flavored spritz drink. Oh, no, I did not see that. And I I do drink. I just don't drink much. <laughs> okay. Well, then you should try spritz. Bloody Society. Mary's is what got me into this. So, <laughs> so then you should, you got to try this pickle spritz that Clausen's just, uh, the Spritz Society just came out with. I would try but that. Anyway. Yes. Tell me more. Dill pickles remain my favorite pickle. Okay. I make a really delicious, crunchy dill pickle. We make tons of those. My next favorite canned good would have to be pickled (laughs) jalapeno slices. I put them on everything. I love pickled jalapenos. 
I make tons of jam, but I personally don't eat a lot of jam, but other people do. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. I'm a cottage food producer. So here in Minnesota, I can sell my preserves to people. And so usually in the wintertime, I'll have a sale of kind of like my excess stock. I'll I'll evaluate what I have in my pantry and say, okay, I can do, you know, five jars of this, 10 jars of this, whatever. And I'll um, label them up all nice and sell them. So jam is a good seller. Do you go to a farmer's market? to do that? No, I actually can do it from word of mouth. I used to host a craft show once a year because mm. I okay. I do hand stamp jewelry too and I would do it there. But now it's just, I keep busy enough by putting like a post out on my Facebook and, and then yeah. people write me now too. My neighbor loves the, the candied jalapenos I make. <laughs> she's my best customer for those. And I'm like, I can show you how to do it. But you know, she's not interested. That's fine. <laughs> right. You're like, fine, buy mine. Yeah. I'm growing so many jalapenos for my husband and I don't like spicy jalapenos. So I might ask for your candied jalapeno recipe. That sounds amazing. Yeah. And last year, my friend grew a bunch of tomatoes and peppers and gave me his starts that he couldn't fit into his garden. And I didn't know what kind of peppers I had. I had a ton and we kind of taste tested and some seemed spicy, some didn't. So I thought, okay, I'll do my candied jalapeno recipe with these peppers. And I figured it would be spicy. It was mild, but people love it. And I'd never done a mild Mm. pepper before. So you could make like a version of that for yourself if you (laughs) wanted to. Yum. That sounds good. But yeah, so I make tons of jams and whatnot. So personally, I like the spicy stuff and the pickles. And then fermentation, kimchi is what got me to even make a fermented food in the first place. I'd have it a lot as a kid because I grew up with my grandparents and my grandpa worked with someone whose wife would make traditional Korean kimchi. And so I ate it my whole life. And then as I became an adult, I wanted to make it, but the only stuff I could find had preservatives in it. And I didn't know that initially. So once I realized that, I started trying to make my own and now I make it, you know, the way I like it. So I just keep doing it. There's a lot of brands out there now where you can find fermented kimchi without preservatives. But yeah, so that's what got me into it. That remains one of my favorite ferments. And then, of course, sauerkraut. Every blend I've made, I love. I've never met a sauerkraut I didn't like. (laughs) Sauerkraut is so good. (laughs) I like putting it on my eggs in the morning. I like eating it with my scrambled eggs. Yeah. I love it with mashed potatoes, which is, I don't know, maybe weird, but I love it. (laughs) Tangy. That sounds amazing. (laughs) Yeah. People ask, how do you eat these fermented foods? You have so many. How do you eat them? Well, I consider them as a finished side, like vegetable side dish. And you can add sauerkraut to like almost any dinner. So we'll see what we have in the fridge and we just add some to our meal and it's super healthy vegetable side already done. Yeah, that's great. No cooking required. And you can pickle also like carrots, like all your vegetables and then just pull them out. I had a friend who has acres and acres of ramps. Ramps are these onions that are only in season where we live for two weeks. And she sent me home with a five gallon bucket of ramps and I didn't know what to do with all of them. So we pickled some of them. And they're so delicious to like throw on a sandwich or just like put on top of anything like or dice up and put in something. So, yeah, I mean, you can really pickle anything. Yeah. And they make a really fun like addition to like a charcuterie platter when you have all your different stuff. And yeah, you get creative. People love it. What's the weirdest thing you've tried pickling that like ended up being cool or ended up being bad? I've seen pickled eggs before. Oh, I love pickled eggs. Yeah, I just wrote an article all about that in Hobby Farms. I love pickled eggs. <laughs> I pickled fiddleheads, which is a recipe in my book. And I ordered them because we have fiddlehead ferns around, but I don't know the difference of what's poison and what's not. And <laughs> I guess yeah. raw, they can make you sick. So I was like, oh, but they are super cute and whimsical looking mm-hmm. once pickled and They were delicious. I mean, I love sauteing them, but as a pickle, they're great. And I love a dirty martini. So we were garnishing them with the fiddlehead ferns. Ooh, that's amazing. (laughs) That's so planty. I love that. Yeah. And one reason I started writing my recipes in the first place is because when I started canning, I was trying other people's recipes and they were huge yields. And I'd spend a lot of money and a lot of time making these things I didn't know if I liked or not. And time after time, I didn't like them. And so all my recipes are small batch because if you try it and you don't like it, you haven't really spent that much effort or money or time. 
small batch, I think is good too, for most of us who are listening to this episode, because we're growing food that we want to preserve. Unless you're, you've got acres of farm, you're probably going to have a couple pounds of tomatoes, a pound or two of, you know, cucumbers, you're not going to have this like overwhelming bumper crop if you are, you know, raised bed vegetable gardening. So I think the the small scale, small batch is a great idea too, especially just to get started. So you're not overwhelmed. And then all of a sudden you have like 40 cans of jam that you don't know what to do with, you know? Right. Exactly. That's the only thing I've made, I think, that I don't like were other people's recipes. And then I had a ton of them. We spent this Mm -hmm. one day pickling garlic and it was fresh garlic and it's sticky and hard to get the peel off. And we spent all day dealing with these garlics and we're like, oh, this would be so good. We ended up not really liking the recipe and it was not cheap. How much garlic? How many cans of garlic did you do? I don't remember because we ended up splitting it. It was a lot and I gave almost all of it away. I mean, other people liked it. I didn't. So, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) But yeah. Did you find a pickled garlic recipe that you like? What do you do with pickled garlic? Well, I love garlic. I mean, Mm -hmm. we eat it in cloves. Just like eat it. It's good for you. But I have a pickled garlic with sriracha recipe in there. That's good. And again, (gasps) pretty much everything in my book except the fruit stuff could be a garnish for Bloody Mary. (laughs) I know. I love that. You are... On the Bloody Mary train. I love it so much. I should have written a Bloody Mary book, I guess. (laughs) I know. With this dirty martini too, maybe that's your next book, Canning Recipes for Cocktails. (laughs) I love it. Okay. So speaking of your book, tell us about your book, your books, plural, for canning, where we can find you. Where can we go learn from you, a trusted canning advisor? Sure. So I have Can It and Ferment It, which is a book where every fruit or vegetable in it has a method or a recipe for canning and fermenting it. So you get to try the best of both worlds because the flavors are completely different. You cannot mimic a fermented food. There's no mimicking it. It has to go through that real process to taste like that sour, tangy flavor and that effervescence. It has to go through that process. And so when I had that book idea, which the book is six years old this week. Congratulations. Wow. In 2020, we had a second edition come out. So it's expanded and there's some other photos and whatnot. But so that's Candid and Ferment It. And I go through the seasons with that book. And then I have Weck Home Preserving and Weck Small Batch Preserving. And Weck is a German jar that's been around for over 100 years. My husband loves Weck. We love Weck. It has glass jars, glass lids, rubber rings, and then two stainless steel clamps. It's all reusable parts. And so this is what we do a lot of our home personal canning in is Weck. And so this one's sealed. As you can see, I cannot take this lid off, yeah. but it's sealed on. So you use the whack jars similar to the way that you would use your standard mason jars. And so I collaborated with them to write books to teach people how to can and ferment with the jars. However, you don't need these jars to use these books. There's a chapter on canning and fermenting in both of the books. And then one has a whole chapter on just like made from scratch recipes that don't require any canning or fermenting. It has, you know, homemade dressing, salad dressings, infused salts, sugars, syrup, just all sorts of made from scratch stuff. And the other one has alcohol infusions of how to make your own homemade alcohol infusions. Super simple, really, really delicious. And you don't have any of those like strange additives that you will get in your flavored alcohols. I love that. One other question that just came to mind. So we're working so hard to get this clamp, right? To get this seal. When it's time to enjoy the canning, you know, the fruits of our labor, how do you get that seal off? How do you break into it? That's actually something that never occurred to me that people wouldn't know how to do. And I didn't yeah. put that in any of my books. And as I was oh, no. selling stuff, people would ask me, how do I get this off? Yeah. I don't know. There is a tool like on your bottle openers or can opener that usually on your can openers, there's a little like hook feature and you probably yes. never used it. <laughs> You can put that little hook right under the lid of your jar and you can lift it up. Also, if you don't have that, you can use a butter knife and you can put it around the edge of the rim. It's kind of hard to explain, but right under the edge of the lid and kind of lift up. 
Okay. So you got to kind of pry it open. Yeah. And it should pop. If your lids are just um, falling off or coming off very easily, I wouldn't trust that it stayed sealed. Okay. So cool. And then where are you on socials? I have a website, minnesotafromscratch.com. It's been a bit neglected over the past few years, but I'm ramping that up again. So join me there. I'm also super active on Instagram, Minnesota from yeah. scratch. I post pretty much every single day on my stories, at least, about what I'm up to in the garden and mm-hmm. in the kitchen. And then, yeah, those are the best places. Amazing. And my books are sold worldwide. So just search them up. Yeah, search them up. And we'll obviously link to everything in the show notes. Well, Stephanie, thank you for coming back so quickly. And I'm so happy to have met you and made you a plant friend. And hopefully we'll have you back on the show in the future for more canning episodes. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much to Stephanie for joining us today. All of her links, her social media, and all of her books are linked in the show notes. If you want to can, I highly suggest Can It and Ferment It. It is just everything you need to know about canning, and it's a great visual. It's a photo book, so it really walks you through what you need to know how to can. I'm so excited to dive into this new hobby with Billy this fall. And yeah, I just love the idea. My mom used to tell me stories of how her mom and all the like little old Italian ladies would jar and can tomatoes together. So I'm very excited to learn how to jar tomatoes to kind of reconnect with that part of my ancestral lineage. And I'm thankful for Stephanie for sharing her story, just like she used canning to connect with her aunt. I hope this inspired you. Tag me on social media at Growing Joy with Maria or share in the Garden Society app what you end up canning and preserving and fermenting from your garden this year. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to green up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app 
or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will Will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click Click the community plan. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. <music> 